Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm super excited about this webinar that we are um, doing today on the ketogenic diet um, for those who have developmental and epileptic encephalopathies that we've planned in coordination with our friends at the KCNT1 Epilepsy Foundation. Um, we have a great panel with us today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them in just a second, but before we get started, um, uh, just so you know, we um, anybody who's joining as a is listening in um, will be off camera and is muted throughout. But please definitely use the chat and the Q and A functions to stay in touch, share thoughts or ideas that are coming up for you, concerns you have, questions you have, and we will um, address those at the end of the webinar. We're going to save plenty of time for questions, um, but. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Gabby Conacher. I am the co-founder of Deep Connections, which has been working the last two and a half years to really bring lots of resources to families who have kids with developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, which is a newer term. I know we're still getting used to that. I still have a hard time saying it, um, but basically it's one of these rare epilepsies what often is hard to treat, um, has hard to treat seizures and um, is often accompanied with developmental delays uh, or regression. So that's what brings us here together today. To start, I just want to introduce our panel. We're really, really lucky um, to have two incredible uh, moms with us today to share their journeys with ketogenic diet, and they have different experiences, so you'll learn different things from each of them. Um, Sam McMahon, um, Mac Oh, I always going to get it wrong because I have McMahon. Mac McMahon um, is actually co-founder and vice chairman of um, uh, um, the board uh, for the KCNT1 uh, Epilepsy Foundation. She is a corporate executive and proud mother to a KCNT1 warrior. Her passion for supporting other parents is, is inspired by her daughter, Charlotte, who was diagnosed with MPE, I, which is migrating partial epilepsy of infancy at nine weeks of age. And since that day, she and her husband, um, they have refused to accept that this would be their daughter's fate and set out to find a treatment. Sam is committed to doing all she can to help not only Charlotte, but the many families who have struggled with, with receiving this devastating diagnosis. So thank you for your leadership there, Sam. Karen, uh, Francis, and her husband live in Ohio with their three children, Brock, who is 11, Jonah, 10, and Mara is three. So Brock has KCNT1 epilepsy. Um, and Karen has a background in, in education and was a primary general education teacher and special education teacher for over 14 years before leaving to care for Brock. So she brings a really great perspective to this. Uh, she now spends her time caring for Brock and her two other children. Um, she's the primary caregiver and primary teacher. So currently Brock does most of his learning from home and they focus on communication skills and other functional skills. Uh, such as toileting. Um, and she's spent a ton of time learning about keto um, and cooking. So you'll be able to get a sense of um, what it's like to prepare meals for somebody with keto. We're also really, really lucky to have two professionals with us today who are steeped in the world of ketogenic diet. We have a Chagalong Chai, uh, Pitz Nuong, who is a child neurologist and pediatric epileptologist. He went to medical school uh, at Concaren University in Thailand and received a postgraduate training um, at University College London in the UK, did his residency in child neurology at the University of Chicago and fellowship in epilepsy at Miami Children's Hospital. So he has been all over the world doing this work. He's currently an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Chicago and director of the child neurology residency training program at UChicago Medicine. His academic and research interest is in dietary therapy and epilepsy, epilepsy syndromes and epilepsy yeah. genetics. So you're in very good hands um, with Dr. Pitz Nuong. We also are really lucky to have a registered dietitian with us. Stephanie is currently registered dietitian at University of Chicago. She received her bachelor's of science from Bradley University and completed her dietetic internship at Ingalls Memorial Hospital. She's been a dietitian for over 10 years and has worked uh, with Dr. Pitz Nuong uh, and ketogenic diet therapies for the past six years. She's passionate about nutrition and helping families succeed on their ketogenic diet journey. In her free time, she enjoys visiting natural, national parks with her husband and walking along Lake Michigan with her rescue dog, Lincoln. Amazing. I can't wait to hear um, what you guys have to share with us because personally, we went on the ketogenic diet many, many years ago. It didn't work out for us, but I know it's a lot um, 
There are a lot of families that are interested in it and curious about it and eager to learn more. So I'm going to start by uh, welcoming um, Karen to tell us a little bit about her journey with ketogenic diet and share some of her insights. So I think uh, we'll all um, go off camera now and give you the spotlight. Hi, thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. That was um, appreciative. And I recently found um, your podcasts and your uh, webinars, not podcasts, but webinars, and they've been super helpful. So thank you. Um, my name is Karen. My um, Epilepsy warrior is Brock. Brock is 11 years old. He has KCNT1. Um, his diagnosis is ADNFLE, which is actually um, autosomal um, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, but Brock is kind of a unique one in the KCNT1 um, family. He also has migrating seizures, um, and not all of his seizures happen at night. Um, he also, his um, seizure started at three months of age, whereas other ADNFLE kiddos, their seizures might not have happened till later on in life, like um, maybe age five or, or above, but Brock started pretty, pretty early. Um, and like other kids with DEE, that's kind of a new term for me as well. Um, Brock seizures are very, very difficult to control. We learned that um, right away. And we tried probably every medicine you can think of um, 11 years ago when Brock first started having seizures and they just didn't work. They didn't work for him. Um, then my mother-in-law actually gave me an article about the ketogenic diet. And at this time I did not um, have any information about the um, keto diet or um, our hospital really wasn't recommending it. I think it was still relatively a newer therapy being used at that time. So um, I kind of put it in my back pocket, but eventually when um, we received Brock's diagnosis of KCNT1 at age three, I believe he was, um, we found out that it is um, a type of epilepsy that's hard to control with medications and I didn't want to keep throwing medications at him. So that's kind of where I found out or went around and found that the keto giant ketogenic diet was something that um, actually we should give a, a try. And we found a um, keto team at Cincinnati Children's where we still go or we still go to this day, but that team um, kind of did an interview with us and thought that the ketogenic diet would be an appropriate choice for us to at least try, um, give it a shot to see if it'd work. Um, so from there, we set up a day for Brock to be inpatient. He was in the hospital for three days to start the diet. And on day one, um, after Brock having hundreds of seizures a night, um, that's probably even an understatement. He had so many seizures um, and even the rescue medications barely worked at this time. So it was just, we just dealt with it. He had hundred seizures a night, at least, if not more. Um, but once we started the ketogenic diet, Brock was in ketosis um, within a few hours after being admitted to the hospital and starting. And we noticed a reduction in seizures that night. So we knew right away that this is probably something that was going to work for Brock. Um, and actually it was the only thing that ever works for Brock. And then it just got better from there, to be honest. Um, like I said, this was six years ago though. Brock's been on the diet for six years. He was seizure free for a little while on the ketogenic diet. And then he started having seizures again. Um, and we kind of went back and forth for years, but then eventually, um, can't exactly pinpoint the difference except for Brock now has a G tube. He has a, a feeding tube, a G tube, and um, he, um, his allergies, he has severe allergies, seasonal allergies. Um, those are intact now, like he is, there's under control. He's been taking injections for the last two years for his seasonal allergies. So those are in control. With the combination of those two things, we're able to find. Um, seizure freedom. And I apologize. I have to stop here for a second. I have a child who is crying. No worries at all, Karen. Uh, 
<laughs> no, no, no. We all get it. I mean, you're in very good company here. I am sitting on the floor here next to my kid who was um, screaming. So we all get it. Uh, Sam, Samantha, why don't you come on and share a little bit of your journey? Yeah, absolutely. Hi there, everyone. My name is Samantha McMechan. Uh, as they said, I am the co-founder and vice chairman of the KCNT1 Epilepsy Foundation. And really what brought me there was my sweet girl, uh, Charlotte Monroe. She's my little KCNT1 warrior. Uh, very much so like Karen, we developed seizures early on, but Charlotte has a different diagnosis. Uh, it's called MMPSI or malignant migrating partial seizures of infancy. Uh, and she was born healthy. We brought her home, everything was going great. She was about seven weeks old and experienced her first seizure. And from there we were living in hospitals and trying to figure out what was going on with our sweet girl. Um, it took quite some time. It took going into the hospital for three or four days, trying something like phenobarbital or Keppra and it seemed to be under control. And then next thing you knew, we were right back in the hospital. So. After about three months worth of hospital stays, we finally got to a place where we started trying the ketogenic diet. We actually wound up at University of Chicago at Comer Children's and met Dr. P and Steph, and they were phenomenal. They introduced the diet to Charlotte very early on. She was only 11 weeks of age, so she was one of the younger patients, and we went round and about. They had tried every anti-epileptic. We were seeing her in this sedated state. Um, we ended up having to move to an NG tube at the time, which was very challenging for me, as uh, Steph knows, and they really had to talk to me about nutrition and why this was so important for her, and she's our first child, so this was the only experience I had, and I was a new mother, and it was a very trying time in our life, but we decided, hey, we need to do whatever's going to work for our little girl, and with these refractory seizures, which basically meant that None of these anti-epileptics were working for her. We decided let's try the ketogenic diet. I know she's young. I know this is a long shot, but who knows? Let's see what happens here. And it wasn't something that I had heard about for seizures necessarily. As I thought about the ketogenic diet, I thought about all my friends who were on their weight loss journey or trying to drop a couple extra pounds. And that was what I knew of keto. So then learning even more from Steph and Dr. P and finding out that this may help with the seizures, um, it was something that I was willing to give a try. So July 3rd of 2019 was the first time we tried this on an 11 week old baby. And within the first 48 hours, we started to notice a significant difference for Charlotte. Uh, we started to notice the seizure reduction, the count. She was much more alert and I was quite happy because she was now getting the nutrition that she also needed. So this was one of the only things that was helping to control her seizures. And what we've noticed is over time, now Charlotte's been on the ketogenic diet for well over three years, she's three and a half years old, uh, is that the seizures do stay controlled with the ketogenic diet and we're allowing Charlotte to grow out of some of the anti-epileptic medication. So we have not taken up her phenobarbital or her Keppra. None of these prescri uh, prescriptions have gone up in dosing. Uh, we've been able to keep that down and really just give her that quality of life that we're looking for for our daughter. But it's not to say that we haven't come across challenges though. There have been a lot of challenges which the team has been so willing to help us out with. Um, some of those challenges are Charlotte's weight. Charlotte's a very sensitive little girl. And anytime we try to increase the ketogenic diet with her, uh, she has a really tough time. Uh, we went from an NG tube and moved to a G tube, which again was a tough decision for me. And it was in the midst of COVID. So I thought, oh, I don't want my baby to be in the hospital and we need to protect her at all costs. So we finally moved to a G tube about a year ago and she's been doing well with that. But with her sensitive system, Sometimes we have setbacks where saying, you know, we now need to slow down the feeds or we need to reduce the concentration and Steph and Dr. P work together and determine what that's going to look like for Charlotte. So keeping her on the growth chart and making sure she doesn't remain too much of a little peanut and that she's putting on the weight that she needs is one of the struggles we run into. And then one of the other ones is medications. Trying to find compounds for our sweet girl is one of the most challenging things. I will tell you, I have five different pharmacies we have to go through in order to try and find medications that are sugar-free. And because of her weight, she can't necessarily take the tablets. So 
we're constantly cutting pills, crushing pills, talking to different pharmacies, trying to figure out what we need to do. And then of course the GI issues that could potentially come with the ketogenic diet. So we are working with the GI team as well. Uh, when Charlotte goes through those challenging times, uh, it's rough on our family. It's rough on her most importantly, but it is something that we are willing to continue forward with because we have seen a difference. We have seen what works for her and why this has been the right treatment really and and what we're looking to do and we have a great team uh, it's not just because they're on this call it's because they are available they want to help her they care about her i think that's such an important part is to make sure that you have a relationship with your care team that you're reaching out via my chart that you're making sure that you're being an advocate our sweet kiddos can't speak for themselves necessarily so we have to be such strong advocates for them and and just like Karen's doing for Brock, it's it's so important for us to be behind them and make sure that that quality of life is there and to have a great care team standing behind us. So I honestly can't thank them enough. I, I know there will be more challenges to come. Um, Charlotte can't eat by mouth at this point. We are working with her on that. Uh, but, you know, those refractory seizures are gone and going from 50 to 70 seizures in a day now down to five to 10 as a baseline uh, is, is a tremendous difference and has given her back her life. So I, I thank the team for that and so grateful and can't wait to hear more about what they have to say. Thank you so much, Samantha. I'm going to hand it over to, um, uh, to the, the medical team now, uh, Dr. pitts Wong and, uh, Stephanie, take it away. We're excited to hear from you all. Hello, um, can you see my slide? Yes, looks Good. great. Okay, um, thank you. So, um, so um, thank you, um, Gabby, and thank you, Samantha, um, Sam, and Karen, um, for sharing um, um, your um, your great stories and um, your struggles and um, and um, and personal story. So, um, so my name is Pit Nubong. I'm one of the shiny neurologists. Um, one of my passions in my career is um, is in the dietary therapy for uh, for epilepsy and also in epilepsy genetics. So, um, so. Um, I got an, an honor today um, to um, to meet with all of you and then um, to to talk a little bit about um, the ketogenic diet therapies for the epilepsy. Right. So, what is um, what what is ketogenic diet? So, the ketogenic diet is a diet that um, contains high fat, has a moderate amount of protein and carbohydrate and very low carbohydrate contents. And um, with this diet, it's and can induce the body into the metabolic state that we call the ketosis. Why? Um, it's come from the concept of um, the body and the, especially the brain can only use two things as an energy fuel. Um, the main one that the body and the brain likes to use is a glucose or carbohydrate. Um, so if the glucose is plentiful or the sugar is plentiful, which is come from the carbohydrate, they will only use glucose. However, in the state that um, the, uh, where the glucose and the sugar are not available, for example, you do, um, you, you're starving, you're fasting, or you eat um, low carbohydrate content diet and high in fat, the body will cheap to use fat as an energy fuel instead. And by burning fat, you have the ketone bodies as a um, uh, byproduct. And when you have the ketone bodies um, circulating in your body, we call that you are in ketosis. And that process can stop seizure in many patients. So ketogenic diets um, for epilepsy actually is not something that is new. We've been using ketogenic diets to treat epilepsy for more than 100 years, actually 101 years to be precise. Um, it, um, it stems from the concept that this is something that um, in the fasting um, or abstinence from food that might help with, um, with seizure and that knowledge is even um, preceded the biblical time from the, um, um, the classical Greek. Uh, um, however, um, in 1921, Russell Wider from Mayo Clinic um, created a diet that high in fat and low carbohydrate it induced the body to become ketosis. And he found that it helps in, um, to control seizure in many patients. And since then, um, the ketogenic diet um, has been developed um, over time for more than 100 years now. Um, and, um, and we learn more and more about, um, about what the diet entails, how the diet works, and um, what is as um, um, who's a good candidates for the diet, what different type of the diets that we can offer to other patients along the way. So 
The next question is a million dollar question that how the diet works to stop the diet, um, to stop the seizure. So we know uh, many mechanisms of the diet, but we don't think that we know everything about how the diet um, stop the seizure yet. But we do know many of um, many of the mechanisms, and we do believe that is a um, is a multi mechanisms. Meaning, it's not just get um, only like well um, doing one thing to stop the diet, like the medication, um, stop the seizure, like the medication. But it's basically it has a poly mechanisms to um, try to control the seizure. One, it changed the neurotransmitters in the brain. Neurotransmitter is a chemical in the brain that control um, how the brain thinks, how the brain function. So um, the diet um, um, can change the um, chemical in the brain, increase the inhibitory neurotransmitter and reduce this, um, the excitatory neurotransmitter. And that can help um, decrease the excitating state of the brain and help with seizure. The diet also acts through um, ion channel Increase this, um, increase this um, ATP dependent potassium channel. So increase um, the hyperpolarized state in the brain and help to calm the brain down. And also through the calcium channel and sodium channel as well. Um, when you're on the ketogenic diet, you um, you use um, fat as an energy fuel instead, and you don't depend on glucose anymore. So there's a, um, so it helps with glucose regulation. So you have a low glycolysis state, meaning the low glucose state, which reduce new, um, neuronal excitation. And when you live with the low glucose state, the satiety hormone called leptin will, in, uh, will increase. And this hormone also found to be anti-seizure in animal models. Um, patient who's on ketogenic diet has found that it's also increased mitochondrial um, biogenesis in the brain. Mitochondrial is an organelle in the brain that produces an energy to the brain. So basically, the ketogenic diet um, provides a good energy to the brain and strengthen the brain um, against the seizure to increase the mitochondrial function. The ketogenic diet also found to be anti-inflammation. It's regulated the immune system and then it's anti-inflammation. It's very, actually it's very potent um, anti-inflammatory um, agent um, called PUFA or polyunsaturated fatty acid and the beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a main ketone that in the blood. The ketogenic diet also found to change the gut microbiomes um, and, and that can also um, um, reduce the, um, the propensity to develop seizure in the brain. And last but not least, um, um, recently we found a ketogenic diet not only has an effect um, at the time that you're on the diet, but when you're on the diet for a really long time, it can change the DNA or the gene itself to the, what we call epigenetic level, meaning that the gene that um, may not be expressed before can become expressed. The gene that expressed before can become non-expressed. So this is what we call epigenetic change. And this, um, and this change has been proven at least in animal models already of the ketogenic diet. And all of these combined um, uh, may explain the anti-seizure and maybe anti-epileptogenic um, property of the diet. And I can tell you the all the medications that are available for the seizure right now, um, more than 30s in um, on the market. It's only can um, can do only the, the first two, change the neurotransmitter in the brain and change the ion uh, and then interfere with the ion channel in the brain. But it will, it lack all others uh, mechanism that the diet can provide. And therefore the diets, it's not the same with medication. It works differently. It works in the poly mechanism and change metabolism, metabolic state. And then has this more broad mechanism to control the seizure than the medications um, can do. That's why when the diet works, you um, most of the time the patient can go off medication because the diet tend to be the one who is doing the heavy lifting. So is that the diet really works? Um, do we have any scientific um, um, support on that or is it all possible effect? Actually we do. So in this, um, in medicine, when you want to know that whether any therapy or any treatment that actually works scientifically, we, we have to conduct, conduct what we call randomized control trial. Meaning that uh, one arm using the therapy or using the treatment and the, the other arm as a control, not doing it and see that how, did, how the difference between both arms. So the diet has been um, 
done that. The first randomized control trial done in the UK in 2008 found the ketogenic diet indeed has an innate um, properties to stop the seizure and control the seizure. And since then, we have at least 12 randomized control trials on the ketogenic diet in children. So it's a beyond reasonable doubt that the ketogenic diet can control the seizure and may have anti-epileptogenic property um, for the patient with epilepsy. How well the diet works in the real world? So because we've been using ketogenic diet for more than 100 years, so there's so many studies has been done looking at um, the efficacy of ketogenic diet. On this slide, I show some studies that has a high numbers of patients. And usually when we, um, um, and keep in mind that this patient usually is a patient who has drug resistant epilepsy, meaning that patient who not responding to many medications, at least two medications, and then um, got put on the ketogenic diet. And then, and then we look at, um, usually in the study, look at either more than 50% seizure reduction or more than 90% seizure reduction over time. And this is um, just a sample of the study that show the numbers. And um, in summaries, um, if um, we put all the study together and then just simplify it and then put it in the, in the broad number, I can say that in the patient who um, do not respond to the ketogenic diet, um, sorry, do not respond to many medications and put on the ketogenic diet and then they can maintain the diet, meaning that they can reach into the metabolic state called ketosis. If I have a hundred of those patients, majority will respond to the diet by having seizure uh, frequency drop more than 50%. However, in those, um, in those um, majority, 20% will, will become seizure free on the diet alone and can um, take off the medication. Another 20% will have more than 90% seizure reduction, might not become, um, might not become a complete seizure free, but um, it's for example, 100 seizure a day might drop to only few seizure a day. Um, as we've seen in many patients and can have quality of life and can, um, can develop and progress to um, the highest um, potential that God given them. So what about um, ketogenic diet used in the developmental epileptic encephalopathies, which is our main, um, our, um, our, um, our main focus um, with this talk. So um, I want to start at what is developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. So this is a um, um, severe epilep uh, epilepsy condition that Amber gave the definition quite nicely in 2010, say that it's a disorder that in which the epileptic activity itself, not just the seizure, even just epileptic activity itself can contribute to severe development and behavioral um, impairment above and beyond that expected from underlying cause of it. And this deterioration can worsen over time. So basically in the DEE, the etiology, meaning whatever causing it, will cause seizure and epileptic um, activity and also cause progressive cognitive and developmental deterioration. However, the seizure itself and epileptic activity itself um, will also cause progressive cognitive and developmental deterioration above and beyond what etiology itself would do. Many of them we can still we, we still cannot fix the etiology yet, um, although it's in the pipeline, um, because majority of the etiologies, more than 60% will be genetic etiology. So we cannot fix the specific um, genetic defect yet. However, the one that we can help and um, try to um, and try to like a wells, um, stop the process of progressive and deter um, cognitive deterioration is to control the seizure and epileptic activities. And this is what all the treatment, including ketogenic diet plays a role. Um, although there's, it could be a hundred etiologies that can cause DEE, once it's come to in terms of epilepsy syndrome that um, it tend to fall into, it, um, as you, um, as you um, majority of us also know, it tend to fall into the uh, four, um, four main cat, um, epilepsy syndromes. The first, um, depending on the age of onset. So one is early infantile epileptic encephalopathy or EIEE, um, which are onset usually in the um, newborn period. And then in the infantile period, early infantile period, usually, um, um, the child will present with infantile spasms, or sometimes we call West syndrome. A little bit later, usually after the first year of life, around one to three years old, um, they will have late infantile epileptic encephalopathy. And more than three years old, usually it progress into what we call lennox gaso syndrome. And all of these fall into, um, fall into the main category of the DEE when it comes to the epilepsy syndrome. But again, it can be caused by a hundred um, different genes. 
So how well the ketogenic diet works in the DE, especially in the genetic DE, which is a majority of the DE, more than 60%. Um, a good study from um, our colleagues in Korea found that um, they, um, if the patient um, has DE from the identified genetic variants, for example, monogenic disorder, for example, you have one gene disorder that known to cause the e, SN1, um, SN1A, SN2A, KSNT1, um, SN8A, all those is a um, identified uh, monogenic variant. They found that if you start on ketogenic diet um, at three months, around half of them, 52%, we have more than 90% seizure reduction. And, and that efficacy remains even at, um, at 12 months of being on the diet. So it's still um, um, 40 to 50% of the patients um, has more than 90% seizure reduction. So, um, and this rate, you will not see it with any medications, I can tell you. It will not, um, usually um, genetic DE, it, um, is, real, is notorious um, that not responding to medications. Right. What about in this um, certain epilepsy syndrome in the um, in the DEE? But um, the one that um, we have a uh, we have um, um, quite numbers of study that um, that we see is the infantile spasm. Uh, many of the DE present early on with the infantile spasm, and yes, the first line treatment um, of infantile spasm is still there's um, there's um, ACTH or steroid or vigabatrin. However, if um, those works around uh, 50 to 60 percent of the time, once you fail the first line treatment. If you start on the ketogenic diet, we found that um, uh, many studies found that um, at least close to 40% of patients can be not just, not just responsive, but can become spasm free after failing this, um, this um, the first line treatment with the ACTS steroid or bicarbitrin if you start on the diet. Um, next, what about um, is any age group the ketogenic diet seem to work best or works better? Um, Yes, it does. It seems um, this um, we found that um, ketogenic diet, um, although it works in almost um, any age group and almost any type of epilepsy, it has a perk in the epilepsy um, in the epilepsy um, in infants, especially with the infantile onset. So, um, so um, um, defined as age of onset less than three months. I'm um, sorry, three years old. Just the infantile onset. If you have epilepsy in the infantile onset and then not responding to um, to any medication and then start on ketogenic diet, we have a good systematic meta analysis, um, meaning that put many studies together and look at um, what is uh, basically the, the, the average response to the ketogenic diet in infants with epilepsy. We found that 60% of infants will respond to the ketogenic diet, even though they, they might not respond to any medication before that. And one third of the infants will become seizure free on the diet alone. Um, this um, this is go along with the physiology that infants can can um, can um, is the age that can consume that um, the ketone bodies um, better than any age group. That's why they respond um, could be one of the reasons that respond to the ketogenic diet well, and that also give um, give us um, um, a rush that if you're gonna start on the ketogenic diet, if you already know that your child has an early onset epilepsy, especially from genetic etiology, you should think about the diet early because. Earlier you treat um, the, um, the patient, it's a better chance that, um, that uh, of the seizure freedom with the diet. Um, apart, from this, um, apart from the seizure, could the diet benefit other aspects of the DEE? Because DEE is not just about the seizure, DEE is also about this, um, the, um, the progressive cognitive deterioration. So apart from the seizure itself, can the diet help with the cognitive functions um, of the patient? So, um, so many studies have looked at that, and then in this, um, in a good recent um, systematic review, looking at for many studies, looking at the impact of the ketogenic on the cognitive function in children with and uh, adults actually with um, um, with epilepsy, they found that yes, ketogenic diet actually improved cognitive function independent um, to the seizure response. So, but um, so you can see that um, this is from on the right hand side. This is the number of the study that they look 
looking at and did the average that they put in the graph uh, on the left side is a um, is a percentage of the patient um, who were cognitively improved uh, on the diet and they found that in all main aspects of the cognitive function attention alertness concentration and global cognition more than half of the of the patients report um, report the improvement in the cognitive function on the ketogenic diet independent to the seizure control and when they look in the different age group they found that um, that um, um, that effect remains in any age group but but uh, most um, but most pronounced in the ch in children so the ketogenic diet not only totally can help uh, with um, the seizure control and epilepsy and the genetic DDE, it also can help um, with the cogn um, improve the cognitive function. And um, in my um, in my humble opinion, should be considered early, um, and at least give it a try in children with um, with DDE, especially from the uh, from the genetic etiology, but also could be from other etiology as well. And um, I'm going to pass on to, um, to the next part, which is the practical part of, of the what is ketogenic diet is and, and, um, and, and um, what type of is and then how, how to monitor and how to do it to, um, to my brilliant dietitian, um, Stephanie Chin. Um, and then I think toward the end, uh, we, we may meet again for the, uh, for the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. P. So like Dr. P said, I'm gonna talk about the different types of ketogenic diets. And this is a, a great chart from the Charlie Foundation, which is an excellent resource for anyone interested in learning more about ketogenic diets. Um, so this shows us that there are roughly five different types of ketogenic diets. But if you take a look at each of the different plates, you can see in green, like Dr. P said, this is a high fat diet. So more than 90% of our calories on any type of ketogenic diet will be coming from fat. So regardless of the type of diet, it's still high fat, high fat, high fat. And now I'm gonna focus on two of the more, um, more popular ones or ones that you might be hearing about from uh, your neurologist or dietitian. So the first one I want to focus on is called the classic ketogenic diet. This is uh, the most strict diet out there. So if you ever hear someone talking about a keto ratio, they're most likely talking about the ketogenic diet. So the keto or the classic ketogenic diet, the keto ratio is how we describe the diet. So the first number is the grams of fat. And the second number is the grams of non-fat. So our protein and carbohydrates. So if someone were to say I'm on the four to one ketogenic diet, that would mean that for every four grams of fat, we have one gram of protein and carbohydrate. So again, highest in fat, it's our lowest diet in carbohydrates. Everything needs to be built in a program um, by the family and the dietitian. So everything is very strict and we are using a gram scale to measure everything that is consumed. For this reason, this diet is started in the hospital. Um, we need to be monitoring um, the initiation process since we are doing the most strict diet, there are potential for side effects. So we wanna be monitoring those in the hospital. And then this gives you a chance to spend time with the dietitian and learn really how to implement this at home and how to build um, families, uh, build snacks and meals um, based on what the family is usually eating at home. And just to get an idea of what the structure of the classic ketogenic diet looks like, um, foods are not typically a four to one ratio or a three to one ratio. We need to create that. And that's why we use a program. It helps us do all that fancy math for us. So typically there's always gonna be a protein. It could be eggs, bacon, hot dogs. Um, we can really work with most foods. And then a carbohydrate, usually berries or carrots, broccoli, cauliflower. We always have cream. So our heavy whipping cream, this is gonna be where we get a ton of fat from. Um, and it's usually our, our milk um, if kids are milk drinkers. And then of course, this diet is high in fat. So we need to have extra fat. So butter, mayonnaise, 
olive oil. Um, even though we have bacon, which is a high fat food, we need to still add some extra fat. So this is roughly what it looks like. Um, and I can show you um, putting everything together what it looks like in a meal. So this is a screenshot of the program that we use. It's called Keto Diet Calculator. Um, and if you're starting this diet, uh, your dietitian will give you access to this. So we're able to plug in these different foods and we set a ratio goal and a cal calorie goal for each individual patient. And then we're able to change the amount of grams of each of the foods to give the prescribed ratio for each child. This is an example of, you know, we could do scrambled eggs or a, a veggie omelet. On the right-hand side, you can see there's a, a list called group B. And so this is an option where a family could pick any of these items to make into this omelet. So it gives us a little bit more flexibility with what we have in the house or what we're making for other children or other people in the family. Um, so again, this is just an example of, of kind of throwing that whole ratio together. The next diet that I want to focus on is the modified Atkins diet. So this is a more liberal version of the classic ketogenic diet. We are counting net carbohydrates. So your dietitian would give you a goal that would be for the entire day and we can't go over that. So they would teach you how to read nutrition labels and how to determine how many carbs are in a food that doesn't have a nutrition label. Um, again, this is a high fat diet. So encouraging fat. I want everything that you eat to be shiny with, with fat, with butter, with sour cream, um, different types of dips. Everything that we eat needs to be with an added fat. Instead of a gram scale, like with the classic ketogenic diet, families will use measuring cups and measuring spoons instead. So again, this is not as strict, but it is still a restricted diet. This diet we would start at home. Um, usually in our clinic, we spend time together during our initial visit going over all, all the education materials. And then I send families on their way and they take a look and they work through the diet. And then we follow up with phone calls um, in my term messages um, to fine tune things as we're, we're moving forward with this diet. And usually we use this with teens and adults. Um, it can be used with younger children. It really just depends on your dietitian and your neurologist and, and what the, the family dynamics are. Um, so that's always a conversation that you'll have with your providers. I wanted to show some fun recipes from the Charlie Foundation. I know waffles and pancakes are uh, something that, you know, families want to make sure that we can still incorporate. So um, the Charlie Foundation has some great options and, and here's just an egg yolk waffle um, and the three ingredients that they use. So it's pretty simple. And then I wanted to have something for a spooky season. So some pumpkin spice fat bombs, and this is just butter, coconut oil, cinnamon, and pumpkin puree. Um, and again, the Charlie Foundation is just a, a great resource for some ideas and inspiration. Next, I, I thought that it would be helpful to go through the, the questions that we most commonly see in clinic. Um, I know that there is time for questions after this too, but just wanted to, to get things started. So I would say one of the most common questions I get is about if your child will lose or gain weight on keto. Um, everything is calculated by a dietitian, regardless of what diet you are on. Um, and if you think about, again, we are making sure that most of our calories are coming from fat, and then we're taking away those calories from carbohydrates. So usually in the beginning, we're getting pretty similar to what the child ate or drank prior to keto. We're just changing the types of food, but everyone is different. And so it's really important to have regular follow-up and communication with your team um, and that your gro child's growth is monitored at regular intervals and making sure that we're not gaining too much or losing too much. And if that is the case, the dietitian will, you know, reevaluate everything and see, you know, maybe that just a simple calorie adjustment is needed. So another question is if my child only gets formula, whether it's consumed orally or through a feeding tube, um, 
G tubes or J tubes, a lot of these different products make things a bit easier for families. Um, even if it's just a, a simple shake that a child would have throughout the day. Um, there's a bunch of different products um, from different manufacturers that allows um, a child who's only getting formula to still explore um, ketogenic diet as a type of therapy. Another question for our, our families that have infants, uh, you know, if I'm, I'm breastfeeding, how can we do the ketogenic diet? So it is possible. Um, the dietitian would just need to calculate how much breast milk a child is getting um, and use the keto formula to create a specific keto ratio based on that patient's needs. And that can be happening with express breast milk, or if a mother is wanting to continue to breastfeed, um, that can also be either supplemented before a nursing session with formula or following up afterwards with a bottle. Keto and, and is it healthy? Um, and Sam had mentioned this in the beginning, you know, the first thing that she had heard about keto was for weight loss. Um, we are using keto as a medical diet. Um, it is not adequate in vitamins and minerals. If you think about, we are taking away fortified grains and a lot of fruits and vegetables. So we're not gonna get everything that we need to get if we were just eating a diet regularly. Um, so nutritional deficiencies can occur. So that is really important for us to be monitoring and having close follow up with children to make sure that these are not slipping through. So there are side effects um, as with any type of medical treatment, but that's again, the importance of having a team that you can follow with closely. Um, some of the more common side effects that we see are constipation, reflux, kidney stones, and acidosis. These are things that um, some of them are short-term side effects, some are longer-term side effects. All can be treated. Um, usually we try to prevent most of them, if not all of them, um, but definitely working closely with your team to make sure that these are all being monitored too. And Dr. P talked about this a little bit with um, responder rates. Um, and Sam and Karen also spoke with their, their child's response rate. Um, we do see some families that see changes immediately and that's, that's wonderful. Um, others, it might take a few months. Uh, we say to, to stay on the diet for at least three months to really give it the full chance um, to have an impact on seizures and, and you know, the importance of having seizure logs to make sure we can see if there are changes. Um, sometimes it's a, a slight change and, and we see some of those other benefits Dr. P mentioned of there's someone's child being more alert or, um, you know, cognition, those kind of things. We, you know, sometimes we see that happen before an actual change in seizure frequency. Will it cause my child to have high cholesterol? This is a, a very common question and concern. Um, we sometimes see that there is an increase in children's lipid panels. We check them at the very beginning when we first meet, and then we check them every three months. And, and we found, and, and the research has shown that usually after nine months of diet therapy, um, these levels, if they were abnormal, become normal and without any type of diet change or intervention. So usually during that first beginning time, we... Um, we'll just say to, to keep monitoring um, every three months. And, and if we get to that nine month, 12 month mark and there's no change, we will um, talk about making some changes. Um, what if my child can't get into ketosis? So this is a, a good question and making sure we understand that being in ketosis is really important to be a part of this diet. And getting all those great benefits that Dr. P mentioned in the beginning. So um, it's hard to say that the diet's not working if we never get into ketosis. So um, the dietitian, um, myself, I usually will ask families who are on my Viatkins to fill out a food log so that I can take a look at all the details and everything that their child's eating and drinking and seeing if something is jumping out on me or um, we'll look at growth. Did we gain too much weight or are we losing? That can affect ketosis. Are we cheating even 
indirectly. Um, maybe we got a keto product that the manufacturer suddenly changed the ingredients. Um, it's really being a detective is, is, is really important with this diet um, because there's so many things um, that can impact ketosis. Uh, something that is, Sam also mentioned is carbohydrate content of medications. Liquid children's medications are flavored with sugar and flavoring because we want kids to take them. On keto, that is, um, can affect the diet. So sometimes pediatricians will prescribe something and, and um, it will have carbs and then we see a flurry of seizures. So just trying to kind of work through anything that changes. Um, and then we have this fine tuning period that we, um, first six months of the diet, we're really just trying to see what works best for each child. And we might be making a lot of changes and, um, hopefully that will just get us into the best place with the diet for the kiddo and for the family. And then how long will my child stay on keto? It depends if it works. Usually we say two to three years sometimes longer. Um, it's really situational, but if the diet was not effective or a child is having bad side effects, we will discontinue the diet right away. And then just a bit about our program here at UChicago. Dr. P started in January of 2015. We are the only program that serves all ages. So we have infants, we have adults, we've had 70 year olds, um, all over the board. And we typically are offering the classic ketogenic diet, modified Atkins and the MCT diet. We've served over 160 patients um, and we have this great multidisciplinary team. Um, I'm so honored and grateful to work with Dr. P. He's such a, a wonderful neurologist and is so passionate about this diet. Um, and we have a nurse practitioner, a nurse, pharmacist, social worker. It's really just a, a great group of people who really are here to support and help um, families on this journey. And then lastly, I just wanted to offer some resources that I find um, have great information for keto specifically for epilepsy. And just if you're looking to learn a little bit more, um, I mentioned the Charlie Foundation a, a bunch of times, but Matthew's Friends and Keto Hope are all great. And then this booklet from uh, Dr. Kosloff and Zahava um, out at Johns Hopkins is a great um, comprehensive book on keto therapy. So thank you all very much. And we're happy to answer any questions. Wow, that was a ton of really fantastic information. I am really excited <laughs> about this being a resource for the community because um, you guys really covered a lot of ground. I want to invite Sam and Karen to come back too and have them just share any reactions that they had that came up maybe while Dr. P and Stephanie were talking that it brought up something for you about a challenge or how you manage, um, just any thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, when Steph said you have to, you have to investigate, <laughs> she's not kidding. Uh, just recently, we realized that Charlotte's toothpaste had quite a bit of sugar and carbs in it, and she's very sensitive. She's on a four to one ratio. She's tube fed. So that was something that spiked her seizures. And when I say spiked her seizures, I mean, she was at a 40 to 50 count again within the day. So little things like that, that you wouldn't necessarily think um, could trigger they do. And we see that with her and teething is one of the worst ones. And I swear to God, this kid's been teething for two years now. So <laughs> it's never ending. She's going to be teething when she's 10. It's, uh, it's one of those things. So I think, yeah, that, that definitely was a light bulb moment for me when she was talking about that. Yes. My kid is almost 10 and teething, so it does continue forever. Sorry to tell you, <laughs> Karen, what you got? Oh, hey, so I have, um, Brock is right next to me. He's just Brock. Talking. That's what he does. You can say hi, Brock. Hi, <laughs> bud. Um, yeah, I just want to say, wow, the resources that you provided families um, or just on this webinar, it was incredible. I did, I'm going to be honest, I did not have that when we first started. Um, we started six years ago and I started investigating it about seven or eight years ago. Um, before we actually started and those resources were just not there um 
I'm thankful now we have a great uh, keto team at Cincinnati Children's and I'm pretty for sure that they offer the diet to um, infants as well as all the way up to adults as well. So I'm thankful that that we have that resource, but I was really impressed by your information. And yeah, like Samantha, um, the exploring um, about what works with keto is it's so tricky, to be honest. Um, we had sunblock with ours. That was a trigger that caused Brock to have so many seizures after starting the diet. Um, that we needed to use as rescue medicine, which, you know, I had to go back and explore, investigate what in the world just happened. And it was the sunblock that I used for him. So yeah, um, topical things do make a difference and they make a difference for Brock for sure. And the other one I learned early on was um, the heavy whipping cream. You mentioned using heavy whipping cream and oh boy, we use a lot of heavy whip heavy whipping cream in our house. And um, I use the Horizon brand. And um, early on in the diet, again, we were probably less than a year in. And I um, made up a whole bunch of meals with heavy whipping cream. But I, the, um, the grocery store that I typically go to was out of Horizon brand. So I just grabbed another brand of uh, that matched the 36% whipping cream in the keto cal calculator that you referred to earlier. And I used it. And then again, Brock had an increase in seizures. And I'm like, what? So I went back through and um, the, your advice of using a food journal early on, I, I think is very, very, very good advice there. But I went back and looked and it's like, what changed? The heavy whipping cream is what I changed. And I looked at the ingredients um, to the brands and the one that I was using had some additives and preservatives added to it, whereas the Horizon brand did not. So that made the difference. And again, I switched back to the Horizon brand and poof, there we go. We're seizure free again. So I had to be very careful and I still am about um, additives and preservatives that are in foods that I choose for broth because those will cause seizures. Um, yeah, so that's my other tip if you're doing this diet um, to start out slow and introduce new, new foods one at a time to make sure that there's not any uh, differences and seizures that was really helpful to me when I was and I still do that now I I use I cook the typical things for Brock every time um, and if I want to add something new in or change something then I just do that I only add one thing in so if he has seizures then I can go back and tie it to the food or if it's not the food maybe it's something else then at least I have some basis to go back and explore so yeah so thank you again though that's great advice, Karen. And yeah, I mean, what you all shared is really fantastic. And I love Dr. P how you included all of the publications. We can all go back and look and see what the science is. It's really, really compelling. Um, I want to get to a question we have from Kurt, who's asking about his three-year-old daughter who has LGS, mm. just started eating by mouth about a month ago and eating depends on seizure activity. So they hear that keto is really strict and partial meals are not acceptable. Um, so thoughts on still providing that eating experience while also really being true to the keto diet? So um, so because ketogenic diets, um, that's, there's more than one type of the diet, like what, um, what Stephanie showed. So uh, for example, like, well, yes, the classic ketogenic diet is it's the most restrictive and um, um, and it may be easier when you like well are too fat or like you are an infant who only formula fat. Once you eat by mouth and eat like a solid food, it might be a little bit of a struggle. However, there's other types of the diet as well. For example, the more liberal version, like a modified Atkins diet or MCT diet, which allow um, which allows uh, more carbohydrate content. So that also an option, but mod modified in is more liberal. Mm -hmm. And um, and then and then the efficacy behind it is still quite comparable. Once you reach into a good ketosis is still quite comparable. Some yeah. study might still say the classic is still the most effective, but what if I think this, um, some studies also show that it's, it's comparable. So I think that in, um, in, in, the, um, in, in the question that Kurt asked, um, especially in LTS, I think it, it's, it's um, to try to try and then maybe um, at least for the modified Atkins diet because the dietitian and the diet program will work with with uh with what uh what the child already is eating and then and then like okay this is what he or she is usually eating how 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 many carbs in it let's try to get carb um off it and this is a quota of the carb per day let's 
incorporate fat into it, and that become modified Atkins. So that that what we we uh, we would recommend. But again, that um, I know that the diet is um, it's not easy and not simple. So to have a good team that to um, like a well with you to help you through the way, especially in the beginning, I think is very essential. And um, and I'm not sure that where's Kurt Bears um, is a um, is Kurt is in New Hampshire. Uh, I'm not sure about New Hampshire. The Boston uh, Children's might be the yes, closest. Yes, Boston might be the 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 um the um the closest. Boston has a lots of good program. Boston Children has a one uh, every last program. Um, Mass General MTH with Elizabeth Field, one of my friends, um, also a good program as well. So yeah, so Boston might be the closest. What I did. yeah yeah in the beginning at least you will um you you need a good team. And then after that, someone who you can like bounce the question or the or the struggle um, like along the way. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that is critical. Anything to add? I think working to with a dietitian, depending on, you know, we have some kids who are primarily getting nutrition with formula and having, you know, either certain snacks that we've built if they're on the classic ketogenic diet that are just for working with a speech pathologist or, you know, based on how much your child would be eating, we could build something that was a ratio for that small amount. I mean, it's the really cool thing about this diet is it is so individualized that we can really create what families need um, and want. And of course, if, if feeding therapy and eating is, is important and, and joyful, that's definitely what we you know, want to make work. Yeah. And I think, um, I wonder too, based on the research, why we don't see ketogenic dying being referred diet being referred more. Is it because there just aren't as many great programs out there? Like that can really, cause I know we did it and it was when a program was just starting and it was not great because they didn't have all of the resources in place, people around to answer questions you really do need a team that is available when you're doing this. Yes, definitely, and and that, um and and I, I share the same feeling that you have. But um um I think that the, the issue is um so basically statistically speaking, the U.S. has the most diet program in the world already, and only thirty five states has it. So fifteen states in the country, which is how many percent? That is almost like a thirty percent of the country for the whole state, doesn't even have anybody who can do ketogenic diet for epilepsy because the number is only 35 states so far. And um, this is, um, and like you said that um, the diet works, works really well, why it's not, um, it's not utilized to the full um, put, um, benefit or potential. It's a couple of things. One, even the neuro, not all Chinese neurologists know how to do the ketogenic diet. Even pediatric epileptologists, not all of us is comfortable with it because it's not even in the curriculum in our training. The same with um, nutritionists and dietitians. Definitely told me that it's not also is also not in um, in the um, in the curriculum. So so it's it's so without the without the knowledge how to do it, it's hard for people to like take it up and do it. And the diet, like Stephanie showed that it 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 takes a village to help the child. It's it takes a neurologist, a dietitian as a core, and also you need a nurse practitioner, um, at least nurses, pharmacists, social workers, so the whole um the, the whole team. So it it really needs investment from the from the hospital and from the program. So I think that that is a barrier why the why the diet um, it's not uh, widely utilized um, and and especially like in older children or even in adults and even in in younger children it's only like a seventy percent of the country has an, an access in their own state which is which is mm -hmm. quite sad and um, and that's a one thing that I'm really passionate about as I'm also um, um, uh, educator I train Chinese neurologists I try to like a well. Um, built in in the, um, in the training so at least they're comfortable with it and hope that one day we'll be at least one of them who wants to like uh, carry the torch and then um, start more the diet program because it can really help children yeah yeah we've got a couple of other questions that came in molly was asking what about long-term keto kids she's wondering how to manage the oral slash pureed non-dairy in a residential setting um, do some families go off the diet because of 
I imagine it's very hard to manage the diet in a residential setting. Um, yeah, and I definitely think needing a, a good relationship with the dietitian there. I know that usually a dietitian is not there every single day, um, but whoever the keto dietitian is trying to come up with a plan with the family of um, pretty straightforward things that they could make. And then if, if um, there's specific challenges, I mean, the dietitian, whoever is at the, the facility needing to just have good communication, I think is key. Um, it's kind of similar to if someone was getting lunch at school, you know, sometimes I will be working with um, the directors at schools uh, to have specific types of foods available. Um, so it might just be a little bit more communication, which I know is not always the easiest thing. Yeah, it's challenging. And she also asked if there's any um, keto teams in South, Southern Wisconsin that you know of for adults. Um, for specifically for adults, um, I know that the University of Wisconsin, but it's not in the Southern, it's in Madison. So has a has an adult neurologist who interested to do ketogenic diet. And I think that she just started, but that's in the Northern, um, Northern Wisconsin. Southern Wisconsin, if it's close to Illinois, I think maybe Chicago is, is the closest because Chicago has three adult program. One, uh, one at Raj University, one at um, Northwestern that just opened and then with us. So, so mm -hmm. three adults program in Chicago and two pediatric program, yes, in Chicago. But in, uh, in Wisconsin, I think there's only one, adult, one new adult program at Madison. Yeah. And Dr. P, is there a place that lists where there are keto programs available? Okay, we'll, yeah. so we'll get that from you. Um, we'll post that. It's through Charlie Foundation. Step, um, oh, we can okay. we can send you the link, um, so you can right. put it on the website as well. So we can. Uh, I'm not sure how updated it is because when I went to look at it, some program that I know that now they don't, they're not doing it. It's still the name on there. Yeah. So I okay. just so, so I'm not sure how updated, but there's a link. Yeah. That's great. And there's usually contact information for each of those centers on that site too. Oh, great. So people can do some investigating. That's great. Um, so I know we talked a little bit about some nutritional deficiency that might happen. Um, somebody asked if magnesium deficiency can be caused by keto diet. I don't know if there are specific reasons why that would be. Um, not that specific. The ones that we know that, um, um, oh, um, let me um, backpedal a little, a little bit. Yes, the diets don't have um, adequate mineral and vitamin. However, most of the program will use, um, use supplementals. Um, when the patient go on diet, we will give multivitamin supplement. Um, we will check the, um, the, um, the mineral and vitamin in every blood test to make sure that you don't, um, you don't run into the, um, to the point of deficiency and then, and then adjust the supplement. Certain vitamin and supplements are more commonly to, um, to become low if you do not supplement it. Um, for example, vitamin D, um, selenium, zinc, that's a more commonly that to become low. Yeah. But, um, and uh, magnesium, it's not that common. Um, I haven't run, in, run, run into one um, so, um, so far. Um, yes. Stephanie, have you seen anybody with hypomagnesemia? We haven't seen a, a, a low level, but if thinking about the food sources that magnesium would be coming from, grains and, and mm. some of the vegetables, I, I, it makes sense. Um, it, it might not translate to a low level. Um, and I just offhand know some families who start, um, uh, have started magnesium supplements and have seen improvements. So I don't know if, if that question is coming from, if they had started a, a supplement and saw um, some improvement. So I see one more question and then we'll wrap up. I know it's getting a little bit late, but. Um... So if the diet was failed, but happened during a period of serious illness, does it make sense to consider trying it again later? And are there particular indicators of potential success or failure that you can look for even in the midst of, you know, maybe some other health issues? Mm -hmm. 
So, um, so for the first question that if they fail during serious illness, I would say that um, to try to restart it again, because during the, seri um, during the illness in any epileptic patient, patient with epilepsy, um, the seizure threshold will go down. So, so the seizure can come out more, even with the good control seizure. If you are a patient with epilepsy, you have the tendency that seizure might break through during illness to start with. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so if the diet usually works, but, um, but it, um, lost efficacy during illness, it's fine. You um, you get over the illness, um, taking care of those acute illness and everything, and then reinitiate the diet. Yes, I, yes, because and I, I wouldn't call it diet failure. It's more just like a, it's a it's a rainy day when you have a, when you have serious illness. It's a rainy day. Anything can happen during that day. You just have to get through it first. So um. The indicator whether you're gonna to respond to the diet or not. Unfortunately, once it comes to the individual patient, listen, the study try to answer that, to find that what is, what uh, how can we predict this um the rest the diet response? We don't find any. Um, it seems to be quite individual, but um only in certain um certain diagnosis, which is. It's still not individual, but it's more like a specific group that we know that the diet would work um, would work well, and then they tend to, um, they, uh, for example, in um, genetic DEE, like I said, that more than sixty percent will respond to the diet. For example, for example, or like a patient with certain metabolic disorder, like a particle group one deficiency, infantile spasm, tend to respond well. So rather like a, a more like a epilepsy specific rather than individual, but we try. Lots of, lots of studies still going on right now, looking at um, different genetic makeup or different like a, um, things that will make patient to predict, to be a predictor that whether you're gonna respond to, to the diet or not. Mm -hmm. And um, are there, yes, so yeah. And um, just want to um, 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 emphasize what Stephanie said that, um, how long you have to wait until you're gonna see the efficacy. So the study has been done and show that the, in the group that will respond to the diet, 50% 50, um, 50 of those, you will see that something change in terms of the seizure frequency um, within two, three weeks. Sometimes even before that, you're gonna see it. Sometimes cognitive function change first, you become more alert, more engaging, even before seizure response. And um, but and then around eighty percent within around like a three um three weeks, but um almost hundred percent in um in three months. That's why we ask to at least try for give a good try for three months. Mm -hmm. Having said that, outlier happened. Stephanie and I ran into one patient that we surprised. Seizure did not respond, but the kid become more alert and more like well, was more engaging. Parents want to continue just just because of cognitive benefit. And at one year, without anything change, became seizure free. And we just like, wow. all right. It just it took we'll a while to kick in, I guess. Yes, we will take it. Yeah, but because okay. and and surprised me as well. But that's an outlier. In general, you you see it with um within like a few months at the most. That's a, but we have one patient out of in, in our program. Yeah, that that's nothing changed. Lot, yes, and then just became seizure free after. Amazing. Yeah, I was gonna comment on that, Brock. Um, like I said, we had he had an instant seizure reduction within the first day that he was showing ketones in ketosis. And then he was seizure free for a while. And then we spent a good two, three years where he just wasn't seizure free. Um, but he was still better than before keto. So we decided as a family to keep going with it and keep trying. Um, but then for whatever reason, I think it might be KCN T1. I think it's that the culprit here, but he stopped swallowing and stopped even chewing. It was the most interesting thing. I have no idea why. Um, we still don't really know why, but so two years ago, then we decided, well, we had to give him a G-tube at that time because he was losing weight. He wasn't eating. I mean, you know, with the keto, you have to eat everything that's in your meal plan or it just doesn't work. So he wasn't even eating everything in his meal plan. So then seizures started getting worse. But with that G-tube, um, that made the difference. That, and then Brock does eat by mouth now too. So we started doing that again. So we do a combination. He does some blended meals that I push through the G-tube and then we do meals that he eats by mouth. I usually do one or the other, like breakfast is all blended meals and then um, lunch and dinner are um, food by mouth, so eat by mouth. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there though, that Brock has been seizure-free now for two years. So we did have this 
two, three year period where he just wasn't, I didn't know what was going on, but now, um, but like I said, I think allergies had something to do with that too. We just couldn't keep his blood sugar in control when his allergies were out of control. So now that we have those in control and, um, the G tube to ensure that he's getting all of his food, um, and on those days that he's sick or doesn't want to eat. Um, or if he has tooth problems, like I know Samantha said, her daughter is always teething. Well, I always feel like Brock, Brock also is still at 11 years old is still having all these tooth problems. Like teeth are still falling out. So, um, but there's things that happen. I'm like, why is he not eating? And then I don't have that kind of backup plan of the G tube. So I'm actually glad that we have the G tube too. It made our lives a lot easier. I think that contributed to Brock's seizure freedom as well, because we are able to do the diet to its entirety. But yeah, he just dropped something. So anyway, I just want to throw that out there that we Great. had difficulty time with it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, incredible. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there, even though I think we could probably keep talking for a really long time because this topic has a lot of, um, ins and outs and, and details that we can um, keep honing in on. But this has been an incredible discussion. Thank you so much to Samantha and Karen for sharing your experiences. It's really wonderful to hear and lots of good clues from you all who you have to be detectives we know when you're um, living this life. So thank you for sharing that. And Dr. P and Stephanie, uh, really amazing information. I can't wait to put this up on the um, resource center for families to, to continue to find and learn from. So thank you all so much. Take care and we'll see you uh, next time. Take care, everyone.